I love the hymns because they're about him and not about us. I am so grateful for the privilege of being able to share the Word of God with us today. I recognize that there is nothing within me that is worthy to declare the Word of God. There is nothing in this body of flesh. We are so dependent upon the Spirit of God to lead us and to guide us and to instruct us in a way that is no way like the way of the world. We're on the road to Pentecost. It is a six-part series, and last week I gave you uh, part two, the revelation revealed, and this was in context with Luke, the 24th chapter, verses 44 through 47, where Jesus revealed himself to the disciples and reaffirmed what they thought they already knew. The action points was the application points, understand God's plan for you, which is different than anyone else. Remember what he has said. Accept what he says is true. And as a result of our relationship with Jesus Christ, we are required to be his witnesses. Today we're going to be talking about the reaffirmation of his love. And our scripture text is John um, 21, 15 through 19, and we're using the NIV version, so your Bible may read a different uh, way. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my lambs. And he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Shepherd my sheep. And he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished, But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will gird you and bring you where you did not wish to go. It sounds like elder abuse. (laughs) I wanted to go to Red Lobster. Why are you taking me to fresh tomatoes? Well, Dad, you need this, but I want this. Anyway, now this he said, signifying by which kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Before Jesus returned to the Father, he wanted to reassure his followers that he loved them And they were obedient to his teachings. For 40 days, Jesus was present on the earth. 40 days. He continued to heal the sick along with many other miracles. He knew that it was not enough just to be visible to a few of his disciples and followers. He realized that they were going to have a task a task of sharing the message of hope and redemption through Jesus Christ under the power of the Holy Spirit. 
You may ask what's significant about Christ remaining 40 days reassuring his followers. 40 days is very significant. It rained for 40 days and nights when God wanted to cleanse the world and start over. Nor waited 40 days after the rain had come to open a window in the ark. Embalming required 40 days. Moses was on the mount, was on the mountain, and it to receive the words of God twice 40 days. And after his descent from the mountain, his faith shone for 40 days. Goliath troubled the Israelites for 40 days before David killed him. The children of Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. One year for each day. The city of Nineveh, Jonah preached and warned the people that they were to repent for 40 days. God would pass, would spare them if they were repented. And we look at Elijah receiving an angelic meal that lasted him for 40 days to reach Mount Horeb. Jesus was seen in the earth 40 days after his resurrection. The number seems to imply a time of testing and a final completeness. Application number one, we are at our best when we are broken. To be broken is contrary to our belief and to our understanding. To be at our best is to have everything going according to the way that we've planned it. Our game is, is working according to the way we have visualized it. I think about my sister who had a fall that required surgery brain surgery. I could not look at that as a best moment for her. But she later told me that that was the best thing to happen to her because she heard from God. I could not imagine she would come to that place. Peter was a broken man because he felt when the when anybody else would walk away from the Lord, that he would be willing to stand there and defend Jesus to the death. And you know he cut the soldier's ear off. And Jesus says, we're, we're not doing it that way, and put the ear back on the soldier. Think about how Peter must have felt that, hey, you know, I'm here to defend you. And he had testified before all of his brothers in, in the faith that if nobody else stood with Jesus, he was going to stand. Peter's heart was, was broken because, as you know, he denied the Lord three times. But God knew Peter's heart. He knew that in Peter's heart he would defend him, that he would die for him, that he would take up the sword for him. And Peter got that opportunity to take up the sword, the Word of God, for Jesus Christ. Peter was broken. He was broken because... He felt failure and disappointment. Jesus had told him, well, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the, the rooster crows. Peter had no strength in himself. Even though he had a willing spirit, he had no strength with himself when fear gripped him. The fear of losing his own 
life. And fear will do that. It will make you afraid. It will make you react and do things you would not desire to do. Psalms 34, 18, NIV, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Psalms 51, 17, the New King James Version, The sacrifices of God are a broken heart and a contrite and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not, what? Despise. You see, when our hearts are contrite, it is with regret that we have sinned against God, that we have fallen short of God's plan for our lives. Application number two. God restores us to full sonship. In just about every family, there are members who reject the privilege and benefits of being identified with family. The seed of rebellion resides within all of us, and at some point, we too will reject our family privileges and benefits for something less fulfilling. Ever since the fall of man, we have experienced brokenness, failure, sickness, pain, and death because we wanted to choose and we wanted to live life our way and not the way that the Father had purposed for us. Application to God restores us to sonship. Jesus not only came to bring us eternal life with the Father, but to deliver us from the penalty and brokenness of our sins. Think about this. Out of all the 40 days, Jesus had set aside one of those 40 days to speak directly to Peter. Why? Jesus knew Peter's heart. Jesus knew that he was a broken man. And you know why Peter got upset? Because Peter knew that the Lord already knew his heart. But Peter had denied him three times. You see, the law of reciprocity is at work, even though we may not know that. Whatever we sow is whatever we reap. So Jesus had to reverse that which was sown by Peter, giving him the opportunity to be reconciled with God. And he asked him three times. After the resurrection, Jesus wanted to bring Peter into the knowledge that God is the God of all reconciliation. Matthew 18, 12, 14, NIV, what do you think if a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will not he leave the 99 on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? My, what a God we serve. If he finds it truly, I tell you, he is happier about the one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing. Not willing. God is not willing. That is not God's will, that any should perish, that any should be without the assurance of eternity with him. God is not willing that anyone should reject the precious gift that he has given us through his son, Jesus Christ. God is not willing. Therefore, God is patient. Therefore, God is gracious. Therefore, God is merciful. Therefore, God continues to love us even in our rebellious state that does not stop him from loving us. 
Application number three, God gives us opportunity to be restored. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you give us opportunity to be restored. You see, the enemy does whatever he can to break us down, to deprive us of our family privileges in Jesus Christ. We are heirs and joint heirs with him. And the enemy works day and night tirelessly trying to get us to deny what God has for us. God has provided everything for us to live eternally with him. He will not force us to choose. And sometimes we as, as loving parents, we as loving brothers and, and loving sisters, we want that person to choose today. And we'll do whatever we can to make that person decide to choose. God brings every opportunity to show a person what choosing is. In the beginning, when he put Adam and Eve in the garden, tree of life, tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God says, choose life. What did we do? We chose death. It's kind of like our kids, you know. We tell them what's right because we've been there, correct? We've experienced it, and we don't want them to go down the path that we went down, and we tell them, we encourage them, we instruct them that there is a reaping if they choose not to go down the path. And what do they do? They go down the very path that you told them not to go down. God gives us choice. God has never failed to give us choice. People may claim to rationalize that, oh, well, I didn't have a choice. We always have a choice. God has never failed to provide us choices. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, chapter 10, 13. In brief, temptation is common to all men, but God is faithful and will always provide an escape so we can stand. Is that a choice? Absolutely. That is absolutely a choice. Consequently, we often choose the immediate gratification uh, resulting in our downfall, missing the blessings that God had in reserve for us because we have chosen to gratify ourselves for the moment rather than follow what God has given us. Peter had three opportunities to stand up for Jesus. He failed each time sinking deeper and deeper into despair. Jesus wanted Peter to know that God is a God of reconciliation, loving us regardless of where we are, and restoring us from failure to victory. John 6, 37 through 40, the New King James Version all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. Thank you, Lord. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that all that he has given me, all that he has given me, I lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will rise him, raise him up on the last day. Did you ever think, did you ever think about this? The more we delay in being restored, 
the more we stray. It becomes harder and harder and harder the more we delay to get back on track. We put off, we put off, we put off, and soon we miss that window of opportunity. God loves us deeply. He loves us deeply. God wants us to be his. He wants to take ownership. So since you are clothed today in your right mind, choose. Application number four. Falling short does not make you a failure. Hallelujah. <laughs> because if that was true, none of us would be here. But look, falling short of God's glory is what every person does because of our sinful nature. We all fall short because it is within us, in this body of clay, in this body of flesh, to rebel, to fail. Think about this. As a chef, not making a meal according to a recipe does not necessitate that he is a failure. Hello. It just simply means that he's left out a very important ingredient or a very important step. He doesn't get to that place and say, well, I'm a failure, so I'm going to do something else. No, just because you fail, brothers and sisters, that does not mean that you are a failure. That you should not give up. God never gives up on us when we're sincerely trying to do the right thing. He keeps giving us the grace and the time to get it right. He wants us to be victorious in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and in the power of the Holy Spirit. In the case of Peter, the Lord knew that Peter was willing to take out his sword to defend Jesus. But that's not the way that this works in the kingdom of God. That's not the way that it works. We're not to take matters into our own hands. We are tempted, but we're not to do it. We're to wait upon the Lord. The Bible says, they that wait, what reward do they get? They will be renewed with the strength of heaven. Waiting it's not something that we enjoy doing. I remember the day that we used to have the, the first gas crisis. Even a day, people were fighting around the pumps because they didn't wait. They didn't want to wait. They will go into the line and get in, to front, and get in front of somebody, and it wasn't their turn. And we look today... As people drive in the villages, they come up to the end of the road and they just keep creeping so they don't have to stop. I've timed it. I think the law says three seconds. Has that changed? We're supposed to stop for three seconds? I timed it. So I'm timing people. And they'll get there, and they're gone. And I'm, and I'm saying, okay. And then outside the villages, there are people who are just zooming across red lights, not giving it a second thought. They'll know that the light is red, and they'll turn anyway, holding up the other direction of traffic because they don't want to wait. And the challenge as we go toward 
Pentecost that it was required to wait on the Lord. Matthew 26, 41, NIV, Jesus was praying in Gethsemane. He came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Do you men, so you men could not keep watch with me for one hour. Keep watching and praying that you not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, I, I would just imagine, I would just imagine uh, if I called a, a prayer meeting for an hour, who would show up? And I, I, I could just imagine that you would think that, oh, we would run out of things to pray for. You would think that, oh, this is, this is very boring. They couldn't. They couldn't pray with Jesus for one hour. There is a heaviness that comes upon us when we want to enter into the presence of God that we have to press into him. See, part of prayer is also part of meditation. You're praying. You're waiting to hear the voice of God. And I think that it's been a long time since we've heard the voice of God speak to us from his word in our closet. We are at our best when broken. God restores us to full sonship. God gives us opportunity to be restored. Falling does not make you a failure. We're all going to fail in something. But I encourage you, get up. Get up. Get up, body of Christ. Get up. Saints of God, just because you have experienced failure, you are not a failure. God will take that. This is how God is. He'll take that failure, turn it inside out, upside down, and use it for his glory for someone else. You see, the Bible says that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. We don't want to acknowledge that we've failed. We don't want to confess our faults to one another because we feel like, well, what are they going to do with that? <laughs> are they going to tell everybody that they meet? Or are they going to be a person of integrity and hold that and pray about that. We've got a tremendous opportunity to bring people to Jesus Christ. When Gloria and I were leaving out this morning, my neighbor downstairs who checks out the <laughs> editorials religiously he has no affiliation with any church or anything. And he says to Gloria and I, he says, are you going to church? Uh, he says, yes. He says, well, make me proud. You see, we never know how much of an influence that we have in the lives of people. But we know that the Word of God says, greater is he that is within us as believers than he that's in the world. God has equipped you and given you everything in this world and the next world to be successful in your witness for him. Let this week 
be different. Let this week be different. Look for opportunities to share your faith with someone, to give them some time, to encourage them, to bless them. Let us pray. Father, we pray for those who are standing in the valley of decision. And Lord, we know that when we are weak, we are strong in Christ who strengthens us. And Father, we bless your people. And Lord, for those that have to make decisions, we ask that you would guide them in the right path. In Jesus' name we pray. Father, we ask your blessings on the community of faith. Lord, may they be so on fire for you that they can't wait for the opportunity to share their faith. We ask you to bless them in the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Lord, anoint them. Use them beyond even their imagination. And may they forever be in the fellowship and sweet communion of the Holy Spirit until the last trumpet of God shall sound. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.